Hi everyone, Hauke here with the third and at least for now final part of my NAS project. As a reminder, when my off-the-shelf network attached storage recently died, I decided to build my very own DIY solution from scratch. In the last two videos, I went over what happened, covered some of the basics, and talked about the hardware and configuration I'm going with. We also got the drives ready that we will use in this build. If you haven't watched it, here's a card you can click on to start from the beginning, as I do not intend to go over these items again. And I wouldn't want you to get confused by any of the references I make. In this video, we'll finally get to what turns a bunch of drives in an enclosure into a bona fide NAS. So, let's talk about software. When it comes to what NAS solution to run, we have many options. TrueNAS, FreeNAS, Unraid. Google it and you'll find about a dozen or so choices and plenty of people advocating for one over the other. So do your research and base your decision on what you want to use it for. I ended up choosing Open Media Vault as it seems to be the best fit for my use case and my aforementioned friend, hi Kurt, recommended it. But also for the following simple reasons. It's free. It's widely considered to be the best alternative to FreeNAS, which may be a touch too challenging for my hardware. It's modular and runs on Debian Linux, so it's relatively lightweight and doesn't take up much space. And it has an active and very helpful community forum. This may be a good moment to remind everyone that I am not really an expert here. And for almost everything from here on out, there are multiple ways of accomplishing the exact same thing. This merely is what worked for me and how I did it. So it's perfectly okay if you occasionally take a different path. Please share your approach in the comment section below though, so we can all benefit from it. The actual install comes to you in six easy steps. Download Open Media Vault, create a USB stick for the install, decide on your OS drive, install Open Media Vault, switch to the web GUI, and make the IP address static. Our first step is to download Open Media Vault. Go to openmediavault.org and click on download. Here you could go straight to the ISO download by clicking on stable, or you could click here or here to get to the exact same place. But let's take a tiny detour by clicking on create a USB stick, which is what we're planning on doing, and click on dedicated drive. Here we get a few instructions along the way, as well as the link that goes to where all the others went as well, and one for a little program that allows you to burn the ISO onto the USB stick. Click on the first link to download Open Media Vault. The current version is OMB6. There's a small five seconds countdown, but then the download will start automatically. While you wait for the ISO to fully download, go back to the previous page and grab the etcher in case you don't have one of those already. Step two is to create a bootable USB stick to install Open Media Vault from. The ISO file is only 830 megabyte big, so a two gigabyte stick will suffice for the install. If you don't already have a way to create your bootable drive from an ISO image, install the etcher you just downloaded and start the program. It's pretty self-explanatory. Insert the USB stick, select the ISO image you just downloaded, make sure the correct drive is selected as this will wipe anything you currently have on that stick, then click on flash to start the process. Let it run its course and when it's done, unplug the stick. By now you should have decided where you want to install the Open Media Vault operating system onto. In the last video I went over the three options we have and why even though I will eventually pick the USB stick I chose to go with the regular hard disk drive for this build. The operating system itself makes do with about 8 GB so you don't need much space. Combine that with a freed up SATA port and reduced energy consumption and a USB stick becomes a rather desirable choice. Just make sure you use a fast one. It does make a huge difference and I will guarantee you a slow stick will frustrate the heck out of you as the system becomes borderline unresponsive. Okay, let's move on to step four, the actual installation. Attach a keyboard and a monitor to your server and make sure it can connect to the internet during the install. It will make things easier, trust me. Add the OS drive to the system unless you decided to use a USB stick, in which case hold off for now. Now boot the system from the stick. You may need to enable booting from USB in the BIOS in order to do that, which for this HP system you enter via F10 during boot. However, your mileage may vary as this is different for every brand. And if you're going to install onto a USB stick, it may detect the install medium as the only drive at the moment by default already. And once you get to the boot menu, you can add the second stick so you won't forget later. 
Click install and follow the instructions. Name your server and enter the domain you are on. If you're using a PC and don't know what I'm talking about, it's likely going to be workgroup. Set a root password and make sure you write this down somewhere. This is the password you will need when you want to log into your server later, either directly or via SSH. Select the drive you want to install to when prompted. Keep going, this part will take a few minutes. The default choices here will work fine, so stick with them unless you know better. The whole process can take a few minutes or even hours depending on what hardware you're using, how good your connection is and what drive you choose to install onto. So sit back and let it do its thing. You'll eventually end up here. Hit enter and wait for your system to reboot. This can again take a minute or two depending on your hardware. Just don't forget to unplug the install media or you'll restart the installation process all over. After the system has fully booted, you should see this screen. Here you can see the IP address as well as the default user and password combination for OMV. For obvious reasons, this is going to be the first thing we want to change once we log in. I mean, what good is a login if everybody has the same one? But we'll get to that part in a moment. Do write them down somewhere though, as you will need all three items for your initial login. At this point, we are pretty much done with the physical interaction with our NAS and can switch over to the web GUI. So feel free to remove the monitor and keyboard and head on over to the computer of your choice. Open a web browser and enter the IP address you just wrote down or still have shown on the monitor if you didn't disconnect it yet. Now enter the default login information, admin and open media vault. What you are looking at here is the so-called dashboard. It's the landing page we'll configure later. For now, let's change our password before we do anything else. Head to the top right and click on the settings wheel. Select change password and enter your new password. Repeat it and hit save. Then wait a sec or two for the change to be confirmed. We can set up other user accounts later, but for now at least your admin account has a password that not every other OMV user knows. You could start configuring your NAS at this point, but in order for Open Media Vault to work the way we want it to, we still need to install a plugin called OMV Extras. That will show up right here. It will allow us to install SnapRate and the union file system that we talked about in the last video. If this is starting to look a bit daunting, don't worry. It really is not. And we'll go through it step by step later. We could install the plugin from within Open Media Vault, but I find it easier to do so remotely. So let's log out and open a secure shell or SSH client. But before we do that, let's check off one last step in the installation process. And that is to make sure that the IP address of the NAS isn't constantly changing on us. If you have DHCP activated on your router, which likely is the default, your router will automatically assign IP addresses to various devices on your network. This changes over time, which is perfectly okay for your phone, but not at all desirable for a NAS, unless you want to go looking for a new IP address every single time the DHCP lease renews. So log into your router, find the IP address you just wrote down in the DHCP table, and lock it to the MAC address it is associated with, thereby making it a static IP assignment. Okay, let's install the OMV Extras plugin. You can use whatever terminal software you like. And if you don't have any, I'll put a link in the description to the free and simple putty I'm using here. Enter the IP address and click open. Accept the warning when it pops up. Log in as root and use the password you created during the install process. You are now connected to your NAS and can execute commands from this terminal. Open a web browser and search for omv-extra. Click on the forum link and you will get to this web page. Here you want to copy the command that is prominently featured. Paste that into your party window by clicking the right mouse button, hit enter, and wait for the process to finish. Once again, depending on your hardware and internet speed, this might take a minute or quite a while, so be patient. At this point, I suggest you reboot the system to complete the install. So log into your NAS and do a Control shift r to perform a hard reload of the page for good measure. You may have noticed that the dashboard looks a good bit different this time around. It now displays some key stats. You can change the content of the dashboard up here. Feel free to play around with this if you don't like what you're being shown. While we're here, let's take a quick look to see if the plugin we just installed showed up and then shut down Open Media Vault. This also gives us the opportunity to add our data drive to the system. 
If you installed the OS onto a USB stick, you may have been a bit disappointed with the lackluster responsiveness while looking around just now. That's because we need a second plugin called Flash Memory that requires OMVIDIA Extras to be installed first. This plugin generates a RAM memory execution system for the temporary files that OMV usually writes to the disk, essentially loading the main system files into RAM so your system won't go nuts constantly writing stuff to and from the stick, which would significantly slow down the system and rapidly age your flash drive. We could use PuTTY again and enter the command sudo apt-get install openmediavault-flashmemory, or we can install it from within openmediavault. So let's log back in. The first thing we see is that the data drives we just installed are now showing up. But we'll get to those in a bit. Note that the bell icon keeps track of recent events, and under system information you can see what version of OMV you're currently running. For now, let's go to System and Plugins. From here you can install any plugin that suits your needs. For us right now, it's the Flash Memory plugin. Search for it, highlight it, and click on Install. FYI, if you need to uninstall it later, it's the same process, only you click on the uninstall icon. Check confirm and click yes. Wait until you see end of line and then close the pop-up window. When we look at the dashboard now, it features flash memory as an active service. While we're here, we might as well install SnapRate and MergerFS, which we will need later. Follow the same steps as before. Once the install is done, we need to apply these configuration changes. An annoying step we likely have to do a lot during the configuration. Repeat the same process for MergerFS, the union file system we talked about in the last video. Looking at the dashboard now, it appears to be slightly rearranged. That's because during the install of SnapRate, OpenMediaVault was looking for required updates, and as the version we installed, 6.0.24-1, is already a few days old, the system was automatically upgraded to the newest version. In this case, 6.3.2-2. You may have also noticed that the Apply Configuration Changes step was no longer necessary for the second plugin after the system was upgraded during the SnapRate install. That certainly would be a welcome improvement over previous versions. So when you are installing your plugins, chances are it will upgrade you to an even newer version and it will probably look different yet again. That's okay, roll with it. Before we go on, let's take a brief look at where those plugins got installed. MergerFS sits under storage and SnapRate is located under services. Hopefully you agree, so far none of this was too complicated, which also means that even if you royally screw up somewhere or it happens going forward, you can simply start over. Seriously, the worst that can happen is you wasted a few hours but learned something in the process. Big whoop. And that's precisely why I'm playing with this training wheel setup trial and error. As long as you pay attention to what you did wrong, you will learn something every time. And trust me, I learned a lot in the process. Okay. Let's configure the NAS. We'll start with the boring administrative stuff. From the top, under system, we have the workbench. Here you can change the time you'll be automatically logged off. I prefer a 30 over the default five minute window, so there you go. The SSL TLS requires a certificate first, so we'll get back to this in a bit. Hit save, and apparently we still have to apply the configuration changes. So my celebration a few minutes ago appears to have been a tad bit premature. Next is date and time. Feel free to select your time zone, but unless you choose not to set up an NTP server during the installation, there isn't anything else to do here. Save and have fun with the yellow. Let's skip notification for now, but we'll get back to that later. Next, you get to influence a couple of power-related items, such as what your power button does. Hit save, and of course, we get to apply those configuration changes again. But I think I'll try doing a couple in bulk this time. As long as the items don't depend on each other, that shouldn't really be an issue. Your mileage may vary. I suggest you keep monitoring checked, and we'll get back to the schedule tasks section once we have our data drive set up. Under certificates, click the SSH, then create, Add a command like SSH certificate and hit create. Then go to SSL and click on create. The only mandatory thing here is the country, but I like to also extend the validity so it doesn't expire on me in a few months. And click create. Before you apply your configuration changes, you can always use the little triangle to see what's about to be updated. 
Now that we have our certificates, go back to the workbench, enable SSL TLS and select the certificate you just created. You can also force a secure connection, but if you're only using your NAS on your home network, it's probably not necessary. Hit save and, well, you know the drill by now. Next one down the list is update management. Under settings, you get to decide what updates will be shown to you and under updates, what a shocker, you'll see all updates that are currently available. There are quite a few, so I suggest you click install updates and kick back with a beverage of your choice for a while. Once the system is done, you'll need to reboot to complete the update installation. We've already played with the plugins and grabbed the few that matter to us, so we get to skip this one. The same goes for OMV Extras. It's the plugin we installed earlier, and for now, there isn't anything we need to do here. We also set up the network during the install, so there really shouldn't be anything we need to change here either at the moment. Okay, that means we're now getting to the fun stuff, setting up the actual storage part of our NAS. If you are coming from a Windows environment, the Linux-based structure might feel a bit counterintuitive at first, but you'll get used to it. And once you've done a few of these, it'll be second nature. Under Storage, Disks, we can see all the drives we have installed. It's basically a list of devices the system has found and is recognizing. There is some helpful information, and you can customize the view further here. This will aid you in identifying your drives when the inevitable happens. But before OMV can do anything with them and they show up under file systems, by the way, this is the OS drive, we need to first configure, essentially format and mount them. This is going to take a bit. Depending on the size of your drives, it might actually take quite a bit, so strap in. I like to start by wiping the drives. I'm not entirely sure you have to do this, but it's part of my workflow and it's not going to hurt anyone. Before the drives show up here and we can mount them, we need to first create the file system. In other words, format them. Go back to File System and click on Create. Select EXT4 from the options, then select your first drive. EXT4 is a general purpose file system that is fairly OS agnostic and MergerFS and SnapRate kind of rely on it. If you'd like to learn more, I'll put a link to a good write-up in the description below. Depending on the size of your drives, this is the part that can take a while. When you close the pop-up window after the drive is done, you'll be sent to the screen where you can now mount it. But let's format the other ones first and then mount them all together. This 250 gigabyte hard drive only takes about a minute and a half to format, but I have seen multi-terabyte drives take in excess of 10 minutes for this. So be patient. To mount the drives, select a file system you've created. If you want, you can change the usage warning threshold. This is the percentage at which the system will notify you that the drive is almost full, so you can take proactive measures. I also suggest giving them a name. A common convention is D1234 for data drives and P1234 for parity drives. This has no impact whatsoever, but you'll see why this might be helpful in a bit. Apply the config changes as per usual, and you'll see the drive is now mounted. Do the same with the other drives, and yes, you can batch these if you are so inclined. All of our drives are now mounted, but not yet referenced or used for anything. We'll get to that next. Again, you can customize this view if you like. Remember the plan to take several small drives and combine them into one single big array from the last video? This is where MergerFS, our version of Union File System, comes in. Go to MergerFS and click on Create. We're now setting up a so-called pool. Give it a name and select the drives you want to add to the pool. This is where having named the drives earlier makes it easier to identify the ones you want to pick. Now, when it comes to create policy, things get a bit, shall we say, non-intuitive. I've played with different policies with varying results and have come to prefer the most free space option as it fills up your drives easily, starting with the one that has the most space available. But others seem to be partial towards the existing path most free space option. I will put a link to a GitHub documentation in the description below. I suggest you read the part that describes creation policies, particularly the path preservation aspects. The next parameter should, at least in theory, so I am told, kind of act as an emergency break. It should overrule the policy we just set and stop the filling of the smallest drive at a specific threshold until all other drives have also reached that threshold. So the default 4 gigabyte is kind of low in that context. I've seen people advocating using anywhere between 5 and 50% of the smallest drive. 
but I've had good experiences with a 20% limit. Given that the smallest data drive in this test setup here only is 80 gigabyte, I'm setting the limit to 16. On my actual setup, this will be set to 400 gigabyte with a two gigabyte drive being the smallest drive for now. The good news is that you can change this later, so feel free to play around with this a little. Ignore options and hit save. Go ahead and apply the changes as we need this to have taken for the next step to work. So far so good. We now have a pool consisting of multiple drives, but no data security. This is where snap rate and our final drive comes into play. Go to services, snap rate, drives, and click on create. Select the first drive. I suggest you start with one of your data drives and name it. Feel free to get creative, but for simplicity's sake, I'm sticking with my previous nomenclature. It's not all that important anyway, as the name is only used within SnapRate itself. Check content and data and hit save. Rinse and repeat the whole thing for all the other data drives as well. Again, you can batch these if you like. Now select your parity drive, name it, check parity, and hit save. Apply, confirm, yes. You can, and if possible, should have more than one parity drive if your setup allows it. But that is beyond the scope of what we're doing here today. When you're done, click on settings. Feel free to tweak things if you know what you're doing. If not, my suggestion is to ignore most of it and focus on the scrubbing. This checks the data and parity drive for errors by recalculating the parity bits and comparing them to the stored information. Unless your NAS is going to get used heavily, I suggest you adjust the scrubbing frequency to something less aggressive, say three weeks or 30 days. But you could also opt to set it to something like 15% each day, which would scrub more than 100% within one week. I'm happy to put a link to the snap rate manual in the description. Feel free to read up on scrubbing and adjust the frequency and percentage to match your needs. Save, apply, confirm, yes. For snap rate to work as advertised, we need to do one more thing though, and that is tell it to update its information somewhat frequently. You're only protected by parity if the parity knows what changes you've made to your data. In other words, any changes not yet synced will be lost if a drive fails. So your NAS usage will influence your sync frequency, as will the age or speed of your system. But keep in mind, you're not syncing everything all the time, only the changes made since the last sync. Let's go back to the section Schedule Tasks under System we skipped earlier. Click on Create and enter SnapRate Sync as a command. Now decide how often you want this to run. Notice for certain date, the time populated is the current one for reference. We could go hourly here, but given my aging hardware and the limited use my NAS will see, I'm opting for a daily sync. You can always come back here and run a Schedule Task manually by selecting the task and clicking on Run. Obviously, as there is no data on any of the drives yet, this doesn't take any time at all. We now have both bitrot protection with scrub as well as parity protection with sync. Great. Now how about getting a heads up before your drives fail? That we can do under SMART. SMART stands for Self-Monitoring Analysis and Reporting Technology, which really isn't all that smart, but it's better than nothing. First, let's turn the whole thing on by going to Settings and clicking Enable. Then set an interval in seconds. I am shooting for a weekly check interval, so that is 604,800 seconds. Leave the power mode set to never and ignore the temperature settings. And hit save. Go to devices and turn on monitoring for each one individually. This includes your OS drive for a change. Now that you have enabled monitoring for each drive, click on Schedule Task and create one for each of your disks. Leave the type as Short Self Task and pick a time. You can play with how you would like to schedule them. For example, you could space each task out by an hour, but have all execute on the same day of the week like I am doing here. Or you could have each one get tested on a different day. Entirely your call. Okay, now let's turn our attention to how we will access the content on the NAS. Step one is to set up a new user that isn't the admin. It's always a good idea to keep those separated. Go to user and click on create. Select a name and a strong password you can remember. You can make the user part of a group, but I'm going to skip that for now. Once again, save, etc., etc., etc. Next, let's create a folder the user can access. Go to storage, shared folders, and you guessed it, click on create. 
name your folder and select the merger of S pool we created earlier from the pull-down menu. The default permissions are fine for now. Hit save and apply the changes. Now go back to the user section, select the user we created a moment ago and click shared folder privileges. If your user does not have read write privileges for the folder in question, assign it by ticking the read write box and hit save and so on. When you go back to shared folders under storage and view the privileges of your folder, it should now display the user with the assigned permissions. Great, now we have a user and a shared folder, but that does not mean we can see or access it from another computer. You may have noticed that the folder is not yet referenced. For that to change, we need to activate a few network services. Head on over to services, and if your network is Windows or Mac based, go to SMB slash CIFS and click on settings. Check enabled and make sure browsable is checked under the home directories, as well as use send file and asynchronous IO under the advanced settings. Once again, hit save and apply the changes. Now go to shares and click create. Select the shared folder you want to be accessible on the network. Enable and make sure the following boxes are checked. Browsable, inherit ACLs, inherit permissions, and enable the recycle bin. You can change how the recycle bin behaves. I like to set it to unrestricted and seven days retention so that accidentally deleted files can be recovered for seven days. You can leave the rest as is. I especially would leave public set to no. This way a person has to be a logged in user in order to access files stored on the NAS. The next thing is going to blow your mind. Hit save and apply the changes. I know! For the record, if you are on a Linux network, you want to go to NFS settings and shares instead and basically do the same thing we just did for SMB. I'm not an expert here, but I understand that having both SMB and NFS on at the same time may cause problems. So pick your lane. Okay, now the shared folder is referenced and should show up on the network. So let's take a look. When you open File Explorer, you should see your NAS under the network section. Obviously, I'm using Windows here, but other operating systems aren't too dissimilar. Because we set up user credentials, you should get prompted for those when you access your NAS for the first time. And once you enter them, you should see the shared folder we set up earlier. We can now copy files to our NAS, but depending on the amount of data you're moving, it may be a good idea to pause the snap rate sync task we created earlier, just so it doesn't run in the middle of our initial data dump. Under System Schedule Tasks, select the snap rate sync one, click on Edit and uncheck Enable. Save and apply the changes. As your files get copied to the NAS, you can monitor how your drives fill up under storage file systems. Note that only the 250 gigabyte drive fills up at first, even though it and the 80 gigabyte drive are tied together into a mergefs pool. Remember that we told mergefs to use the most free space policy during setup? It is doing exactly that, using the drive within the pool that currently has the most space available. Watch what happens as the space left on that drive equals the space left on the other one. Now they are both getting filled at roughly the same rate. The eagle-eyed among you may have noticed that the parity drive is still empty. That's because no sync has happened yet. So when your initial data upload is complete, I suggest running a manual one. Go to System, Schedule Task, select SnapRate Sync and click on Run. Hit Start and after a few seconds, the system will tell you how long this is going to take. Find something fun to do and come back when it's done. Close the window and while we're here, let's put the task back on schedule if we disable it earlier. When a drive hits the 85% full mark, that's the warning threshold we set up when we mounted the individual drives, this happens. And as you add more and more data, you'll eventually run into this. That is when the minimum free space limit we set up earlier for the merger of S pool kicks in. By the way, if you have deleted files that are still in the recycle bin and you need to free up some space, you can go to services, SMB, shares, select the shared folder you want to free some space up on, click on edit and manually take out the trash. There is one thing we skipped earlier that's worth going back to, and that's notifications. 
it's rather unlikely that you're going to regularly log into your Nest to see if everything's going okay. No, you'll set it up like we just did and then stick it in the corner somewhere and let it do its thing. So notifications can be really helpful if you need to be made aware of something. To set them up, go to System, Notification and click on Settings. Check Enabled and configure your SMTP server. If you don't know your specifics, check on your email provider's webpage. They'll usually tell you what to put in for server, port, etc. If you are using a third-party email program like Outlook, you likely have done this at least once before. You can get creative with the sender email. This is not used for authentication, so it doesn't have to be real, and you can make it stick out in your inbox if you want to. You can pick up to two email addresses to receive notifications. If you click Test before you have saved the settings, you'll get an error. So save them and apply the changes first. Then come back here and send a test email. Verify you've actually received it and everything is working and check your spam folder if not. Then click on notifications and select what you want to get notified on. Fair warning, if you leave everything checked, you might get a lot of emails. If you are using an ancient CPU like I do, for example, and leave load average checked, your inbox is bound to fill up with about a notification a minute while the system is actively doing stuff, as MergerFS and SnapRate can be quite CPU expensive tasks. So I personally reduce the notification to what's important to me, which is file systems, smart, I suggest you never turn that off, defeats the purpose if you do, and software updates. For now, I will leave process monitoring on as well, but there's a good chance I'll turn that off later. Once again, save and apply your changes. By the way, having passed the 85% threshold from earlier would be one of the things that you'd get notified on. The last thing I want to do is revisit the dashboard and clean it up a bit. And while we're here, let's switch to dark mode, because why not? Looks like we also have a few new updates, including a new OMV update. So let's take care of those while we're at it. By the way, the dashboard interface remembers in what order you check the boxes, so you can rearrange how it displays your information that way. And there you have it, a DIY NAS on the cheap with plenty of room to grow. Now, none of the things we've done here are chisel and stone, so feel free to create your own test setup and play around with the settings. And when you change your mind halfway through the configuration, you can either start over or make changes. Just keep in mind to work your way backwards. You can't just go and delete a merger FS pool if it has a shared folder set up on it. The option is actually grayed out at that point. You first have to go to SMB CIFS and delete the shared folder and so on. So basically do what we've done here in reverse order for any particular thing and you'll be fine. I will start working on my actual setup, install OMV on a USB stick and repeat the setup with my three larger data drives. And of course, use one of my 16 terabyte drives as an external backup to the NAS. Remember, RAID is not backup. There's a chance I will simulate a failed data and or parity drive and then rebuild it in a separate video. But for now, it's your turn to build your own DIY NAS. Let us know in the comments what hardware you use and share your experience, good or bad. I hope you found this helpful, because it took a while to put together. If so, consider leaving a like and maybe subscribe so you don't miss if and when I continue the story. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.